It is my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker. Steve Shapiro is the chief of the section of primate behavior at the Keeling Center. He conducts research aimed at improving the welfare of captive non-human primates, and his group utilizes a comprehensive behavioral management program, including environmental enrichment, socialization strategies, and especially positive reinforcement training techniques to provide the primates with opportunities to voluntarily participate in veterinary husbandry and research behaviors. I'm also happy to say that Steve was one of the first people that taught me how to do any of this stuff, um, and so I'm excited to hear from him now. Uh, and without further ado, Steve Shapiro. Like the other two speakers said, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, uh, grateful for the invitation, but perhaps I'm a little more grateful than the other two speakers because my Australian in-laws are at my house. It's week number three of five. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not the least bit unhappy to be here uh, from that perspective as well. Uh, and uh, if they're videotaping this, which I think there was some mention of, maybe that part won't get on YouTube. <laughs> I think the rest of my life would be a little less enjoyable if, if that happens to make it to YouTube. But I, I said it, I'm going to have to deal with it. That's the way it is. Um, so I'm, I'm the one up here talking. You know, there are many, many people that have contributed to the work that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you know, I, I started at MD Anderson with Molly in 1989, if you can believe that. Mike Keeling was the director of the center, uh, the Keeling Center. Well, it's now called the Keeling Center. He was the director of what we called the Science Park at that time. And I, I have to pretty much say that none of the stuff that we would be talking about today, me, Molly, maybe all of us, uh, would have been possible without the, the contributions and the efforts of Mike Keeling. I think he was a leader. Uh, for certainly behavioral management of non-human primates in captivity and the proper management of non-human primates in captivity. And you can see there are a lot of very skilled technicians on this list, quite a number of uh, DVMs and some of the PhDs that we've worked with over the years. Okay, so I, I'm going to start, you know, at a, at a fairly basic level. I'm going to try and emphasize some of the things that Molly said and, and probably some of the things that Chris said as well. I'm in the dreaded number three slot where the first two speakers said everything I was going to say. So I, I have to um, try and make it sound fresh, even though it's going to be very similar to what they were talking about. So non-human primates, says, you know, live in social groups in the wild. That's what we're trying to functionally simulate in captivity. That's the point of the socialization type approach that we take. We want to functionally simulate natural conditions in captivity. So, you know, non-human primates in the wild live in, in social groups. Molly already told you that. Um, some of them live in fairly large groups. I, I've given you some pictures here. Uh, many of the macaques live in large groups. Chimpanzees live in large groups. Ring-tailed lemurs, vervet monkeys, squirrel monkeys, and baboons. So the, these are, you know, fairly common, except for the ring-tailed lemur, probably uh, fairly common research non-human primates. And uh, you know, we're, we're interested in, in again simulating the way they live in the wild. And then, of course, there are other species that live in small groups. And Molly talked about that: monogamous pairs, something like that. Uh, marmosets, tamarins, owl monkeys, td monkeys. Orangutans tend to be fairly solitary in the wild. Uh, the siamangs that you see there are, are pretty much monogamous. So um, except for the siamangs and the orangutans not used that much in research right now, the other four species on the slide pretty much are. And uh, we're going to have to do different things for animals that naturally live in small groups than we are for animals that naturally live in large groups. So we're going to take slightly different approaches for what we're going to functionally simulate from them. So when we start thinking about, as Molly told you, when you start thinking about how to house animals in captivity, you want to have an understanding of how they live in the wild. So you really want to understand some of the natural social processes that are taking place in the wild. And I really only picked just a couple that I thought were particularly relevant for what 
uh, really this meeting is about. So there are some natural social processes out there. Um, you know that non-human primates immigrate and emigrate primarily to um, prevent inbreeding. That's how new groups form. That's how animals move between groups. Uh, you know that sometimes animals other than the parents take care of infants. So that's called alloparenting. I think you're familiar with that. And I think you also know that to become a good parent yourself, particularly in captivity, uh, you know, in the wild, it's a little bit more natural, um, you have to have opportunities to take care of infants before you have your own. So I think alloparenting is gonna prove to be uh, a fairly important thing for what we talk about today. And then, of course, there's aggression in the wild, and we, we know that there's aggression in captivity with wounding and those kinds of things. Uh, you know that there's intra-group aggression and aggression between groups as well. Uh, between group aggression is not really gonna figure into the captive situation, but certainly within group, intra-group aggression is going to figure in. So I'd just like you to kind of think about those particular social processes that are natural, um, Maybe we want to functionally simulate certain aspects of them, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't want to set up conditions in which animals are going to definitely be aggressive towards one another. Maybe we want to set up conditions where we can minimize aggression within group aggression. And so we, we really need to pay attention to those kinds of things. So again, I, I'm gonna say it a lot of different times, it's probably gonna appear on most of the slides that have words. What we're trying to do is simulate the functional aspects of the natural environment in captivity. And for the purposes of what we're talking about here, we're gonna focus on the social environment. And we wanna do that for a number of different reasons. Molly showed you, you know, the regulations, the new animal, the guide, the Animal Welfare Act, all these kinds of things. Um, we're, we're interested in um, satisfying those regulations, operating within the confines of those regulations. But it really goes a little bit further, I think. We're not, we're, we started behavioral management, Molly's group started it, you know, a long time ago. And, the idea wasn't simply to satisfy regulations. It was to satisfy the animal's needs. And I think sometimes that's something that gets a little bit lost in the whole conversation. So I, I think what we want to think about is how we can address regulations. And this is particularly important with the NIH's working groups report and uh, the director of NIH. I'm allowed to say that while I'm here. He's, he's not going to appear from above or anything like that, is it? No, he doesn't come to little stuff like this. Um, <laughs> so, you know, with the chimp report that came out, group size is very important. Enclosure size is a very important uh, factor in whether chimp research or chimps can be maintained in captivity, that kind of thing. So it, it really doesn't apply just to chimps. It's, it's to all non-human primates in captivity. And that's where my expertise is with non-human primates. I don't know much about dogs and rabbits and, and those kinds of things. But I think one of the things that's really important is that we have to think about ways that we can satisfy the animal's needs when they're in captivity. And that's what the pair housing is about, that's what the assessments of temperament are about, all these other things that you've already heard about are better and better ways for us to take into account what the animals need when they're in captivity, when they're in, I'm talking about social groups, but you know, in, in pairs or whatever. And I think one of the things that happens is that the balance between the animal's needs and human convenience sometimes is uh, out of proportion, where human convenience gets a lot of emphasis and animal needs get relatively little. So one of the things that I hope that uh, housing animals in compatible groups is going to do, non-human primates in compatible groups, is going to not, not restore the balance, it's never gonna be like this, but sort of get the animal needs to have a higher priority up against human convenience. Because as Molly pointed out, there are some inconvenient things about housing animals socially, but uh, as she also said, you know, she wants the, um, the, the benefits for the animals to be weighed just as heavily as the benefits to the humans uh, for housing animals singly versus housing animals socially. So I want you to think about how, what we can do or how some of the things I'll end up talking about might help to uh, change the balance of, let's say, human convenience and animal needs in, in a social context. 
So uh, if you've never been to our place, uh, I work at MD Anderson in Bastrop, and we have chimpanzees living in corrals. There are eight of these corrals attached to this one building. You can see there are no tops on the corrals. So what we're doing is we're getting ready to feed the animals yogurt, frozen yogurt that's in the container. So one of the reasons I'm showing you this is uh, really just to give you a feel about what social housing entails when it comes to something as simple as feeding a preferred food. So we go from corral, it turns out corral one to corral three. And this is a celebration, something that chimpanzees uh, naturally do in the wild when they come across a favored food source. And you can see the other three corrals that are down the side of that, that building. Four corrals down the left side, four corrals down the right side. Uh, you can see that they're pretty interested in getting fed, right? Because frozen milk is a favorite thing. And one of the things that happens is sometimes when they go into the celebration, there's a little self-directed aggression, there's a little social aggression takes place. Molly's group was doing some work at that time on trying to um, manage some of that feeding-related aggression in a social group by feeding them on a predictable versus an unpredictable schedule. And to make a long story short, unpredictable feeding helped in reducing aggression at meal times that didn't affect the dominant status of particular individuals at other times. So it was it's important stuff. So here's the guy with the frozen yogurt. And uh, you'll, you'll see that animals sort of tend, they, they sort of tend to distribute themselves throughout the enclosure so that they can get their, um, their food without too much competition with others. You can see that they can catch you can't see that they can throw, but take my word for it, they can throw uh, with high degrees of accuracy. Unfortunately, it's post-digestion rather than pre-digestion. And so for something as simple as feeding animals in a group, favored food, these are the kinds of things you had to go through. Okay? All right. So... I told you that some species of non-human primates live in large groups, some live in small groups. Uh, animals that live in multi-male groups, multi-male, multi-female groups, uh, they can be a little difficult to manage. Let me just go back one slide, sorry, I forget to mention one thing. I underline compatible in the title. You've heard about compatibility a million times today. So we want to house primates in compatible groups in captivity, not just in groups. And I think that's important with the paired stuff and everything that we've talked about up till now. It's got to be compatible. Okay, so sometimes multi-male groups can be difficult to make compatible. One of the things that you can do is use unit, because males fight with one another, um, you can use unimale groups, particularly for species that are matrilineal, groups that live in situations where it's the female matriline that's really the focus of the group. Most species of macaques, baboons, vervet monkeys, most of those species, they're all matrilineal. Eric, you didn't start the timer. This is going to... Uh, it's going to hurt everybody in the audience, not just me, because I'm not going to stop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So you, you can advance it. Yeah, take, take some time off. Uh, put me in the penalty box preemptively. Okay, so you can use unimail groups, again, as functional simulations for species that are, are matrilineal. So take these squirrel monkeys at our facility, for instance. We house them in unimail, multi-female groups. So what you see there is a whole bunch of females and their most recent one or two offspring. And there's only one adult male in the group. And I'm not sure you're going to be able to see him in uh, this particular video. Obviously, he's doing some breeding. Otherwise, there wouldn't be juveniles and infants in there. But it turns out that in squirrel monkeys, males aren't big players in the social dynamics of, of the group. They're uh, kind of actively ostracized at particular times of the year. 
So this is a, just an example. And, you know, just to give you some perspective, the enclosure isn't much longer than, much wider than this. It's about 20 feet deep, but it's not much longer than my, my two arms put out like that. So uh, just when you're thinking about enclosure size, social group size, et cetera, et cetera, that's just something. Okay, and here a rhesus monkey is living in a fairly standard corn crib. It's a unimale, multi-female group. Uh, Molly made her presentation interactive. I'm going to make mine interactive too. Which one's the male? Come on. The one every time he moves, everybody else jumps up onto the wire and, and gets out of his way. Like that. Okay, so uh, that's kind of how things would be in a naturalistic group of rhesus monkeys. Uh, so again, this is a functional simulation. We can get breeding, we can get production, we can get the macro lines, but we don't have to worry about male-male aggression in this situation. So again, it's, it can be a, a useful functional simulation. Okay, so for species that are patrilineal, in which the males form the core of the social group, and uh, you know, that, that applies to chimpanzees for sure. And I've been thinking about this for a day or two. Are there other patrilineal species? No, nothing came to my mind. So we'll, we'll leave that as a, as a pondering point, I suppose. Does anybody know of any species of non-human primates in the wild where it's the male-male bond, of brothers stay together and that kind of thing? Uh, we're all together in this and not being able to identify anything but uh, chimps. So here we have a situation in which we do want multi-male groups. And Mike Keeling is really the one who uh, started this so, so long ago. Um, it's male-male social interactions that are critical to the day-to-day -day social life of chimpanzees. So here we have a situation, two adult males and one infant to start with. And I guess that one's not going to play. I must have missed that one. OK, so never mind about that. OK, uh, you would have seen the infant playing, when the males eventually groom, and they're all kind of hanging out together just to show you how important male-male uh, interactions are. OK, uh, as, as we've been saying, multi-male groups are sometimes difficult to manage unless you have enough space. So many primate centers have large field cages in which they keep many macaques. Uh, if you've been to the Southwest Foundation, which is now the Texas Institute for Biomedical Research in San Antonio, you know that they have very large baboon enclosures with multi-male groups in them, of course. And you know that the vervet monkeys that used to be at UCLA but are now at Wake Forest also live in multi-male groups. Uh, you can keep species that live in large multi-male, multi-female groups where the match line is the most important in large enclosures uh, successfully. And so uh, I do a little bit of work, or I did a little bit of work in Mauritius. So here's a situation where we have two adult males and 45 females and their most recent offspring at a breeding facility in Mauritius. Uh, we're able to house them uh, successfully like that. We get excellent, they get excellent breeding. And what we're trying to do here, we're going to talk a little bit about, more about positive reinforcement training at the end. And Molly talked a little bit about it already. What we're trying to do is... Uh, sort of get control of the males so that we can work with the females. In Mauritius, they hand catch the animals and um, we needed a way to put the males in a cage within the cage voluntarily so that we could work with the females and the infants while the male was in the cage, you know, and so that the male wouldn't bite us in the calves, basically. Okay. So here you see the male um, inside a cage within the cage being acclimated to desensitize to uh, the door of his cage within the cage going up and down. And you can see it's a multi-female, multi-kid, multi-juvenile group and there's a lot of animals in there. Okay, so that's what I was going to say about the large groups. Things are different, uh, you know, fairly different when you have some of these small groups of non-human primates, animals that tend to live monogamously in the wild. Uh, one of the things that seems to happen is that you probably want to limit intergroup sensory contact among owl monkeys, uh, among common marmosets, among tamarins, 
uh, some of those species, particularly if you're trying to breed them successfully. Because if you think about how those particular types of non-human primates live in the wild, they live in territories that are pretty far apart from other members of their species, and they don't usually come into, let's just say, visual contact. Owl monkeys don't usually come into visual contact with other owl monkeys. Uh, common marmosets don't usually come into visual contact with uh, other common marmosets. But if you've been to any of the places that breed non, uh, these monogamous primates in the United States anyway, you'll see that large numbers of social groups of marmosets will occupy the same room. Large numbers of owl monkeys will occupy the same room. And uh, I think you'll also see that the production in many of those facilities is not particularly good. Chris talked about stress. We're interested in stress. What could be more stressful for a pair of owl monkeys than having uh, well, let's just say, and I'm making up this number, kind of, 67 other pairs of owl monkeys in the same room that they're living in. So if you know what owl monkey, they have owl monkeys here at NIH, those are some owl monkeys there. This is one side of a room that's really a very nice room with a waterfall down the middle, 34 family groups down the right side of the building, 34 family groups down the left side. This is our facility, it, it's really very good. It has skylights so we can simulate uh, the falling of dusk and the, the beginning of sunrise. Uh, we have light tubes rather than lights. So if a light breaks, nobody has to go into the room to fix it. Our monkeys really don't like being handled that much. Okay, so we can have strangers, our physical plant people, repair the lights from outside the room rather than having to go inside the room. So I'll just show you just a quick video of, of what the waterfall looks like. And I'll tell you the reason we have the waterfall is for environmental enrichment. It's a constantly changing thing. You know, people have tranquility fountains and that kind of stuff. It's designed to uh, calm the monkeys down. It's designed to prevent them from seeing other owl monkeys. Uh, you perhaps could hear, and you will hear again, I hope, that it generates a lot of kind of white noise. And the white noise will prevent the owl monkeys from hearing other owl monkeys being handled, which is kind of critical for what we're trying to do. So maybe you can see the owl monkeys living in their nest box. And then I just have, you know, to give you a little insight into what we're doing here. Uh, this is an in a view of the whole room. I got up on a tall ladder, got up above the waterfall, uh, didn't fall off, but violated every OSHA uh, rule and regulation by not wearing a proper harness and what have you. But this will give you an insight to what it's like at dusk in one of these Alamo rooms. Now this is the best housing for groups of owl monkeys that you can do, but it's still not perfect, okay? There are 68 family groups of uh, owl monkeys in 0. .0003 kilometers squared. That's a really high owl monkey density, okay? Things to think about. And uh, so it's 175 monkeys per room. And again, you know, that many per kilometer squared. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what strategies you might use to form groups. So you're going to take your animals that you have in captivity and you're going to form social groups from them. Maybe you've uh, extended past pairs. Now you have trios, quads, whatever it happens to be. You want to fo form some groups. Now there's natural processes by which groups form, and I've just called them accumulation, and I, I didn't have a better word for it. So obviously in the wild, a, an adolescent owl monkey leaves the family group, a male looking for a female that got kicked out of her group as well. When they're able to get together, they form their own territory and they make a pair. That's what, I, what I'm calling accumulation. Uh, sometimes uh, matrilines form together to form new groups. The Cayo Santiago people would understand that particularly well. So that's another way that you can form a group. I already told you that animals immigrate and emigrate in order to prevent um, inbreeding, among other things. Uh, you know that perhaps chimps live in fission fusion societies where they break up uh, for part, the whole community may be 100 animals, but you're very unlikely to see 100 animals at a time. During the day, they fission off into smaller groups and maybe uh, 
the whole community fuses at some point to make, make this larger community. Um, you know that large rhesus monkey groups will sometimes fish in into smaller groups. That happens at places like Cayo Santiago, and it perhaps happens in some of the field cages at some of the, non, at some of the primate centers. Um, it's perhaps easier to manage out at Cayo Santiago than it is to manage in a place like the California Primate Center, where a fishing is typically associated with, with death and um, a lot of injuries, something that's sometimes called a cage war. And you know that you start with a group of one male, seven females, and what happens? You know, you have a corn crib, it has one male, seven females. Uh, the least dominant, the most subordinate uh, female ends up looking bad, and what do you do? You take her out, you have one male, six females, then what happens to the number six in that scenario? Eventually, she's not looking so good also, and now you're down to a group, you know, over time, one male, three females, something like that, and uh, you need to form new groups from, as a function of that. Okay, so, when you're forming groups in captivity, again, we're going with this functional simulation uh, concept. We have to consider a lot of different things. Compatibility, we've already heard about. And all I need you to think about is to use all the available information that you have when you go about forming a group with more than a pair of animals. And, and what I mean by all available information are things like Age, we've heard about the effects of age on pairing. Sex, we've heard about the effects of sex on pairing. Uh, temperament, we've heard about the effects of temperament on pairing. All of these same kind of things factor and social rearing, upbringing, those kinds of things. All those influence how compatible a particular group is going to be. And so one of the things that we've used with our chimps in a slightly different way than Chris has used it with caged monkeys, because remember we're talking about groups, is that we assess the temperament of our chimps. We have a good publication about that um, and what we're doing with the information. So it's one thing to collect temperament information. As Molly talked about, what she likes to do is solve problems with science. So we've collected this da these data and now what we want to do is use the data to um, improve the conditions for the animals in captivity. So we know which of our groups are most compatible. We'll, we'll focus on chimps for the time being. And we know what the temperament characteristics of compatible groups are. And we know what the temperament profile of incompatible groups is. Okay, so when it comes time for us to try and form a new group, obviously, what are we going to do? We're going to try and model it after a group that, has, that is compatible and has, let's call it, the compatible group temperament. Okay, so one of the things we, we do to assess compatibility, just like Chris did, we use a novel object. Our chimps have received very, very many different things as part of our behavioral management program. Um, there's not all that much that's novel to our chimps, but this karate dummy whose name is Bob, and actually that's Bob the Fifth, uh, you'll perhaps get some insight into hap to what happened to Bob's one through four. Um, we expose the animals to this novel object, and it's Bob the karate dummy, it's human-like but it's missing vital human parts. Sometimes the chimps understand this and sometimes they don't. We can discuss that in a second. So here's the first instance of this particular group of chimps meeting Bob. And we're interested in how the different animals react to the same stimulus. I mean, that's, that's the profile we're looking for. So this is just a couple of seconds later. I, I like short clips rather than large clips. So uh, unfortunately, well, for, I don't know. Unfortunately, fortunately, you decide. We've used martial arts videos as part of our video enrichment program for the animals. 
and perhaps uh, Jackie Chan and Jean-Claude Van Damme and whatever else, has had a disproportionate influence on the animal's behavior. Um, but again, you know, we're interested in who's doing what to Bob the Karate Dummy. So we use the Sopranos also as part of our uh, video enrichment, which is another mistake. But you can see uh, different animals responded differently to the, the Karate Dummy. And we can assess the personalities of the individuals based on those responses, the response to novelty. And then we can build a profile for the particular group to uh, determine, you know, we know whether they're compatible or not based on the number of injuries that they have. And we can see what we can do about uh, building new groups that match that compatibility profile. So Bob the Karate Dummy stands up beautifully to kicks and punches and slaps on the head. You saw all that. But canines to the testicles that he doesn't have and canines to the top of his head does not, uh, Bob doesn't do very well with that. All the department's veterinarians and all the department's men couldn't put Bob back together again. Uh, even with uh, stitches, we rushed him to the clinic and we couldn't save him, unfortunately. Uh, the surgical glue melted him. So uh, that wasn't such a great thing for us to do. Uh, Bob didn't care, I mean, come on. Okay, so like I was saying, we wanna use all the different information that we have, the animal characteristics. We've already heard that you do better when you use younger animals uh, formed into pairs. Very much the same thing when you're forming groups, younger animals tend to do better. And um, one of the things that we don't do, but we should do, and we're probably gonna start to do in the, in the future, is make use of some of these network analyses that are currently being uh, pioneered and utilized and implemented and applied, which is really the key thing, at the California National Primate Research Center. They're able to look at particular groups of animals and define networks of social interactions, and they're able to determine First, retrospectively, based on some of the network analyses, what caused a group to fall apart? And then more importantly, they're able to look at the data proactively to see if they can preempt groups falling apart. It's a fairly complicated statistical work. I don't understand the details of it, but um, they're having very good success at identifying uh, what aspects of social groups need to be maintained in order to keep groups, large groups, 150 animals, compatible. And more importantly, they've been able to identify a couple of things that they know uh, that when this bad thing starts to happen, then groups are likely to fall apart, okay? So I, I think this is, if, if you want to read some things, Brenda McCallum at Davis is the one to read about this, and uh, her stuff, in the next 10 years is gonna be very, very important. Okay, so one of the things, another thing that you have to consider is what you're using the animals for. So for our, from our point of view, we have three different species of owl monkey. We don't want any inbreeding, we don't want any hybrids. So we're very careful in forming groups of animals that are of the same species. You know, they're three different species. And maybe you can tell from that photo, those photos, maybe you can't. Owl monkeys are very difficult to tell apart. It's hard to tell males from females because they're monogamous, which means they're the same size, no sexual dimorphism, a little bit easier. Rhesus monkeys, baboons, chimps, things like that, because there is a lot of sexual dimorphism. Okay, and sort of continuing along the lines of utility, you know, if you're making an SPF colony or a super SPF colony, then you, there are things that you have to consider when you're, you're making your groups. So how do some of these uh, pathogens in the, the SPF, you know, herpes B virus, simian T cell lymphotrophic virus, something like that, how are they transmitted? And how do you have to manage your groups so that you can minimize the transmission 
uh, across individuals and obviously across groups, but really within groups is what you're trying to manage transmission if an, any of the animals happen to have any of the pathogens. And then how do you manage a loss? So if you have one animal that comes up indeterminate or positive for one of the viruses, what's your next step? Do you disband the whole group, uh, just isolate the group, give it another test, whatever? There are a lot of things to consider. Okay, and certainly for rhesus monkeys, there was a time when we were considering uh, breeding lines of MAMU A1 positive animals and maybe uh, B17 positive animals, something like that. So you really want to uh, define your species and manage the groups so that you can get maximum utility out of uh, these captive populations. And another thing to think about, of course, is their research destiny. We asked about, you know, if they're going to be paired and then one is sacrificed as part of the study, what happens to the other guy who's left behind? You know, is he grieving? Is it better to have been paired and then uh, lose your pair mate than it is never to have been paired at all? This, uh, I'm quoting, that was Shakespeare, you know. He was a <laughs> biomedical researcher. Um, and you know the, the same would apply in groups. So now we're thinking about situations in which we might be able to manage a group so that we could take one animal out, do a study on it, put it back or not put it back, something like that. So you have to think about the animal's research destiny. And we, you know, Molly's told us very nicely about the, the social history of the animals being uh, really important if you're brought up poorly to start with. In many circumstances, you're not going to get better, and you're not going to make an outstanding model for biomedical research. Uh, you're not going to be easy to house in a pair, maybe. You're not going to be easy to house in a social group. So it's really important for us to understand and uh, utilize and employ what we know about the social experience of the monkeys. So I'll just show you, uh, hopefully, a video. You like the way that monkey looks? You want to put him in a group with other monkeys, either like him or not like him? It's not going to be good for him either way, okay? And uh, here's the same monkey, he's one of the two in the pair. So now we've socially housed him. Did we make him better? Not from that video, certainly not. But here, after an extensive behavioral management program, you know the reason monkeys swim in the wild all the time. They jump in the canals. Kyle, they jump in the, uh, the rain pools. So uh, using a therapist like uh, that you talk to three to four month old, was Chris, uh, the three to four month old youngster being a good therapist for nine to 12 month old socially uh, isolated rhesus monkeys. Here's an example of an animal who's been through a therapy program like that. That's the same monkey. And I'm hoping you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's pretty good, okay? So we can form groups. It takes a lot of work to succeed in this regard. It's one of our only successes in bringing back monkeys, providing therapy for monkeys. So I'm not going to say we cured them. We provided therapy. We brought them back just a, a significant amount. Um, but the best way to, it, to deal with these abnormal behaviors, as Molly and Chris talked about, is simply to prevent them from developing rather than trying to cure them. Curing them is very difficult. Preventing them from uh, developing these abnormal behaviors is really quite easy. Harry Harlow showed us how to do it, you know, 65 years ago. We, we know how to do it. Okay, so uh, there's some interest in what age you should wean your infants. We wean our young rhesus monkeys at seven months of age, and I think it's too young. I think they should be weaned at one year of age. But we're a production colony, and our veterinarian is very much in favor of the seventh month weaning thing because he thinks that females are gonna have an easier time with their next pregnancy if they don't have to worry about having an infant on them. The fact that uh, rhesus monkeys in the wild at one year, uh, females with one year old infants on them have a new baby 
and the interbirth interval is like 384 days, so it's you know basically one year. Uh, that doesn't go into uh, the veterinarian's thinking. So uh, we would like the animals to get a little bit more social experience, maybe be weaned at one year of age, but it's an argument that I can't have with him because it's an argument that I can't win. Except in my personal family life, I try not to have arguments that I can't win. Okay, in my family life, unfortunately, uh, I've had many. Too much sharing? Always, always, that's, that's just my style. You're all my friends. So, um, because we have an 84% production rate in our rhesus colony, unimale, multi-female, about 1,000 animals, SPF, uh, no one can touch that, okay? So even with weaning the animals at seven months of age, they turn into outstanding breeders and outstanding parents, okay? So despite the fact that from a behavioral point of view, from a textbook point of view, I would like the uh, babies to stay with their uh, moms for longer and their social groups for longer, our weaning situation has worked beautifully. Seven months, they produce like crazy, everything's good. Okay, and you know, obviously, uh, we, we have good breeding competence, 84% production rate. Um, the owl monkeys and the squirrel monkeys don't really breed as well, and I think for the owl monkeys anyway, uh, well, part of the reason is we don't want any more owl monkeys. We have too many and there's no demand for them. Um, I think part of the problem with owl monkeys and, and marmosets, these monogamous species, is that they live in these big rooms with many, many social groups, and it's a very atypical situation for them, and I think it adversely uh, affects their reproduction. Um, for the squirrel monkeys, one of the things we end up using are sort of nursery groups. Uh, we'll, when we know, when we identify pregnant females, we'll put them into groups with other pregnant females and move them away from the adolescents in particular because adolescent squirrel monkeys are big time aloe mothers. And it's good for them, they learn how to mother, but it's bad for the infant because they're not lactating and they're raw. They don't know how to do it right. So the infants uh, may suffer a little bit in that circumstance. So that's kind of where I am there. Um, most non-human primate species have some alloparenting, and like I said, it helps you be a better mother. May not help the offspring of a subordinate female who can't get her infant back from the juvenile offspring of uh, a dominant female. So uh, that, that's something I studied a long time ago. So here, I got two quick videos of a, I have one quick video of Allo mothering. This is not the, the chimp baby's mom. This is another female. And in fact, this female did most of the uh, carrying and interacting with this particular baby. And there, there are some good things for everyone to learn in that circumstance. Okay, we've also used all male groups, so some people say, you know, that, that's gonna cause all kinds of problems. Well, with the chimps, which live patrilineally, we have plenty of male-male pairs, um, or we, we've had plenty of male-male pairs over the, the, the past. We're moving away from that because we need a minimum group size of seven, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, male chimps tend to get along just fine. Male rhesus monkeys, when we did our SPF derivation strategy about, I don't know, 23 years ago now, uh, we had extra males when we formed breeding groups and we just put them in all male groups. And they did just fine and in fact, males that had uh, experience in all male groups ended up being better breeders than males who had not. Okay, there was the confounding factor of age, but still uh, the experience you gain in a male-male group can be advantageous to you as a breeder later on in, in life, in you know, uni-male, multi-female situations. Uh, you've already seen that we can form groups and we can occasionally uh, provide therapy for the abnormal behaviors that we see, but it's not always the case. Um, Age, I already told you, is really important. Young animals go together better than, than older animals. We've all seen that. This is Justin Mar Mauritius again. I don't know why they're not showing you. 
Um, as Molly said, one of the things you have to do is monitor for compatibility. We can use observations like Molly talked about three times a week for each pair. We don't do our observations anywhere near as frequently unless you consider the daily rounds that the veterinarians, the vet techs, and the behavior people do uh, looking for wounds. If we're looking for wounds and we don't see any, we've essentially monitored for compatibility, right? And at some point, we're going to get uh, really involved in this network analysis, I think. It's pretty good stuff. So uh, I think that's another uh, way we're, that we're going. And as Molly told you at the very, very beginning, the best thing you can do for non-human primates, a socially living non-human primate, is give it a compatible group mate, partner group mate to live with. There are other types, that's the best form of environmental enrichment, social enrichment. There are other types of enrichment that you can use and you can use them in uh, all, all sorts of different group settings. So here's something as simple as a banana feeder where the animals kind of have to compete to get access to the limited amount of resources that are there. It's an opportunity for them to express their dominant status in a socially sanctioned way and maybe they don't have to beat the crap out of somebody else just because they're able to express their dominance over the original device. Again, they don't need another outlet for it. So our monkeys, you know, we reverse the life cycle. Uh, they're fresh fruit eaters, they're ripe fruit eaters, so we need a way to uh, enrich them, so we'll put some ripe fruit on the, on the astroturf bars in that, that maybe you can see there, I don't know how well it's out. Uh, they're not overly interactive during the daytime, because it's their sleep time, but they are relatively active at night of the year. Okay, visual barriers are something that can be used, particularly in groups, to maybe um, prevent some aggression from taking place. If an animal this can is get the 15th of November, 2011. This is the day one of the Kong. The Kong toy on the left will be filled. Kong toy on the right will be empty. We're going to expose for 10 minutes. Visual barrier, and animals can get on the other side when they're being chased, and that's an advantageous thing. Um, I've already shown you a little bit about the training. Obviously, if you keep animals in groups and you want to work with them, then you're going to have to uh, use your positive reinforcement training to get them to do what you want. Um, here's a group housed animal going to give us a conscious blood sample by inserting its arm in the sleeve, sucking on the juice bottle that's put up there, and you, you'll see no anesthesia is involved. Uh, current term is acquiescence, so is the animal acquiescing to what we're doing? That's a question that I'm asking you. I don't like this particular term, acquiescence. I, I think acquiescence is what you do when your wife begs you to take out the garbage. You acquiesce and take out the garbage. You don't volunteer and say, honey, I'm going to take out the garbage. This, is, this to me is volunteering. So there's a vacutainer, there's a blood sample, and uh, you know, this is how much effort goes into uh, getting a blood sample in a social group with positive reinforcement training being the operation. And I'll just show you one other thing. We have an animal with a bad lung, so we've taught the animal to use the nebulizer, and the nebulizer has a butyrol or something else in it. So I'm asking you to figure this is voluntary participation. Yes, so one of the things we're working on most closely, most uh, completely right now, is getting the animals to voluntarily participate in their own medical care. And I'll, I'll just show this last video and then I'll stop. So here's an animal with arthritis. It's getting acupuncture and laser therapy at the same time. It's living in this group, uh, no problem. Good boy, Sammy. And the important thing is that, that I want you to look at is that we're not giving the animal grapes, apple, or anything during this process. The animal is working for the positive reinforcement of the acupuncture treatment and the laser therapy. So the animal has made the assessment that the benefits of sitting there for this process, you know, the benefits that are involved in pain relief, better gait, et cetera, et cetera, are positive reinforcement enough for him to uh, 
volunteer to do the behavior. And obviously we're doing that with animals in the group. So just the last thing that I, I want to say is that um, uh, one of the things that we're struggling with with our chimpanzee colony in particular is that we have a lot of very old chimpanzees. We have three that are 51 years, uh, 52 years, almost 53, and we have about 40 that are 40 years and above. And um, if any of you are in that age range yourself, you know that things that used to work don't work all that well anymore. And um, you can't move around like you used to, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a large number, or uh, uh, an important number of animals that are mobility impaired. So we have to form groups based on their, uh, their mobility. So we have mobility impaired groups that are in enclosures where it's less likely they're gonna fall in the event that there's a ruckus with the rest of the animals. So that makes it difficult for us, and you don't really care, but I mean, I mean, it makes it difficult for us to meet some of these 20 foot height requirements for certain subsets of animals that would probably not benefit from a 20 foot height for chimps in captivity. And uh, you know, with, with these geriatric groups, we're having to manage a lot of different things. And just the last thing I'll say is that we're constantly assessing their quality of life. We have a publication coming out in Animal Welfare that describes our quality of life, life assessment system that incorporates, uh, Susan Lamb is the one that's done this really, um, it incorporates not only veterinarians in the assessments of quality of life, but the behavioral team as well. And not only do we look for changes in clinical chemistries and, and clinical parameters, but we also look for changes in behavioral parameters. Animals that used to like to do things, when they stop liking to do those things, we get worried. Um, when they stop liking to interact with people, that worries us. And for animals that never like to interact with people to start with, when they start to like interacting with people, we worry as well. So we're looking for changes in behavior. And I, I think we, we have about seven animals on this quality of life watch at the moment. And I, I think it's a fairly important uh, aspect of keeping animals in groups. So uh, my summary is just that you heard what we had to say. It's all about forming compatible groups, using all the information that you have, same types of information that you would use to form compatible pairs that type of thing. And once again, I want to thank all these people who uh, you know, have really significantly contributed to what I told you about today. So thanks for listening. I'll be happy to take it.